I am going to continue in the book of Nehemiah, but I'm going to skip chapter 7 and chapter 8 for today. Chapter 9 deals with the heart. It deals with prayer, fasting. It deals with what the people were going through. You see, up to this point in the history of the Jewish nation, as they were returning from exile, their hearts still were far from God. You remember what happened, right? You remember when the nation was taken into captivity, first with Israel and then several hundred years later with Judah. Do you remember what the tipping point was for Israel? It was when the nation split. And you remember uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam had split the nations. Rehoboam stayed in Judah and Jeroboam had gone to Is- uh, to taken the northern, had taken the rest of the kingdom, the other ten tribes, and they had um, made the nation of Israel. But when Jeroboam took the nation, God actually had given him a promise. Do you remember that? Do you remember Jeroboam's the promise that God told Jeroboam? He said, "If you will follow me, if you will keep my dictates, then." Then I will make your nation, I will make your descendants as great as that of your father's David's. Now, he wasn't literally of David's lineage, but he was given him a promise that if he would follow him, that he would allow his descendants to be as great as David, as the promise that he had given to David. But Jeroboam was very jealous of what was happening in Judah. And so Jeroboam was scared that the people would continue to go to Jerusalem to where their temple was at. And that they would, their hearts would be hearts would be turned over to, uh, to going back to the temple and reunification, if you will, would take place. And, and that wasn't that didn't sit well with him because once again he wanted to be the he wanted to be the leader, he wanted to be the king. It was it was a pride issue. As we received the word this morning, I, I, this is that was confirmation that I should go ahead and move forward with this 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 message. There was a pride issue. There was an issue that was going on in his heart that would continue with the nation of Israel. And you remember what his sin was that God, that God grieved him, right? What did he do? Do you remember anybody? He, he built a calf. He went back to the same sin that Aaron had committed with the nation of Israel with Moses. Once again, they built another God. They wanted to build another place to worship, and they wanted a tangible God that they could control, that they could see, that didn't require faith on their part. And that became a legacy among the nation of Israel. They wanted, when they wanted a king, it wasn't because they wanted to have a great ruler. What they wanted was somebody who, could, who they could see, they could point at, and they could say, that's our king. That's the one who leads us into victory, just like every other nation here. It was a pride issue. And even when they come back, when, they, when we look at these chapters in Nehemiah, the people are grumbling, they're crying, they're complaining, and, and, and rightfully so, right? They've been through some stuff. And and this is not what, remember we talked about imprecatory prayers last week. God doesn't want us not to be real. He wants us to be real with him, to, to un, for us to allow our emotions to, to let him know, hey, God, things are not right. Things are not the way that they're supposed to be. This is not what you promised to me, God. My, my adversaries are against me. Everything's falling around. God, will you direct me? You see, but the, the point was that they had to point their hearts back to God. And up to this point, they really didn't. They were still just kind of trying to restore. They were trying to restore Jerusalem. Their focus was on rebuilding the greatness that, was, that once was. And then something happens. As they're going through there, they're seeing God work. And these, these, actually, these verses run parallel to Ezra chapter 2, 3, 4. What, what, what Ezra talks about, they, what they find is they find scrolls in the temple. And they bring out the scrolls, they read the scrolls, and their hearts are challenged. Because all this time they're working towards this goal, thinking, hey, we're going to do this. God has sent us a leader. And now they're realizing, hey, we're going to do this. God is here. It wasn't just God sent somebody. It was God is here. 
God is, God is in the midst of all of this. And, and with, that, with that thought, I want, you to, I want you to read with me. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. It says, on October 31st, the people assembled again. And this time, they fasted and they dressed in burlap. And they sprinkled dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all of the foreigners as they, listen, listen to this, as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their fathers or their ancestors. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord, their God, was read aloud to them. Then for three hours, they confessed their sins and they worshiped the Lord their God, the Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shabaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani, and Kenanai stood on the stairways of the Levites and cried out to the Lord their God with loud voices. Who? Who did that? Listen, the Levites. The ones who were in charge, exactly, of, of being that mediator of God to the people. They finally get it that it's not about religious service. They were impacted in their hearts and the people come in and they're impacted by what's going on. That they're moved by what God is doing. There's a detoxification that is taking place in their hearts. They are literally going through the process of what we went through the first 21 days of this month. At least I did. It was a detox of mind, detox of body, detox in spirit. All of the things that we hold fast to or let go. And God begins to reveal to them something fresh and something new. He begins to show them that it's not by might nor by power, but it is by His Spirit, declares the Lord their God. They receive greater clarity to understand what God's plan and their purpose is. They are now in a place where they recognize that God is their source. All their time, all this time, they thought that God was huh, somebody who kind of helps us. He's up there. He really is not that interested in us. He has some interest in us. He, I mean, yeah, you know, if I'm, if really gets hard, I'll, I'll, I'll pray to God. But, but it's more religious thing. You know, I'll repeat that prayer that I say at the dinner table. God is great. God is good. Let him bless me for my food. We'll say that prayer at night. You know, I'm really tired. I'm really wore out. And we'll say the prayer. What, you know the prayer at night? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And then we don't really think about what we're really saying. Because <laughs> I want to wake up the next morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we say things that are rote repetition and it becomes so disconnected. And the nation of Israel was so disconnected. And I want to challenge you. How connected are you with God? How connected are you that when the Spirit of God reveals to you that it, it wasn't you, it wasn't your cunning, it wasn't your resume, it wasn't your ability, that it was Him at work, do you give Him recognition for that? And are you moved then to then take that and recognize Him? That when you hear his word, when you hear, when you're in the company of others, that when we're coming together, that we are truly moved by what God is doing in our midst. Or is this just going through the motions? Is there true detoxification taking place in our spirits? And if it is, then there should be an element of not only do we come and, and we fast and we pray and we, we wear sackcloth and look down 
But Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6. Actually, he says three things. But I'm going to look at, I'm going to show you this. Listen, look, look at this. When you give, I want, I, want to, I want to point out to you this fact. God has some expectations on us. When we truly believe that he's at work, he has, he has this expectation. He doesn't say, if you give, if you pray. He doesn't say, if you fast. He says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. Now, think about that for just a second, because you'll see that here. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, bowing, blowing trumpets in the synagogue and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward that they will get. If they want attention, they'll get attention, but they're not going to get anything else. Don't do it like the hypocrites do. Keep going. But when you give, once again, this idea, when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Verse 4, give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Now skip over to uh, verse 6. Go ahead. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. Does it say if you pray? No, it says when you pray. Why? Because this is a habit you should have in your life. When you pray, do it this way. Now, this is not a prescription, a full prescription of how you should always pray. There are many ways in scripture that talk about when you pray. But he goes, he he is tackling the heart the heart of where you're at. When you pray, make sure that you're not doing it for attention. Make sure that you're doing it to connect with your Father who is the one who has provided for you, the God who has been with you, the God who has never left you nor has He ever forsaken you. When you pray, now keep going. When you pray, don't babble on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Go skip to verse 16. Now look at this. When you fast. For many of us, we say, well, if I fast, I might fast this year, I might fast next year, I might fast in 10 years. But he says, when you fast. Why? Because it was once again, this establishment... It had been there from the very beginning. God had called men and women to fast. And here in Nehemiah's day, the people are are moved to a fast. God didn't institute the fast. Actually, if you read chapter 8, you'll see that what Nehemiah commands the people to do is to go out and do what? Celebrate. Feast. He tells them to feast. But they come to the recognition that even in their feasting, they must have a solemn reminder of who God is. Now, Jesus called out the ones who would then take that and make it into something that it was not. And look what he says. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable. They, they uh, try to look miserable. Some people don't need a whole lot of help. And disheveled. So people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth that it is all, that is the only reward that they will ever get. Go ahead. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Now, this is, not, this is not talking about a corporate fast when we say, hey, let's pray for 21 days. Let's believe God for the future. Let's... This is talking about when you have this attitude of once again, God has moved in your spirit. He has moved you to a time, a time where you are detoxing with him, asking God for revelation, asking God for move, more, more of his spirit, asking him for clarity. When you're doing that and it's personally moved, he says, don't make it a big thing. Don't make it so that, that people don't even know what you're doing. And even when we do call a corporate fast, 
Make sure that your heart is in the right place. As a matter of fact, Nehemiah calls them out on this as he's also recognizing that they are coming together for this, for this purpose. Look at verse 5 of Nehemiah chapter 9. Then the leaders of the Levites, Jeshua, Academy, Bani, and all those names, prayed, called out to, to the people, stand up and praise the Lord your God, for he lives from everlasting to the everlasting. Then they prayed, may your glorious be na- name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessings and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You preserve them all and the angels of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him from Ur of the Chaldeans and you renamed him Abraham. When you have proved himself, when he had proved himself faithful, you made a covenant with him to give him and his descendants, the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Gergashites, and, and you have done what you have promised, for you are always true to your word. You saw the mer- misery of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cries from beside beside the Red Sea. You displayed miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, his officials, and all his people, for you knew how arrogantly they were treating our ancestors. You have a glorious reputation that has never been forgotten. You have divided the sea for your people so that they could walk through on dry land. And then you hurled their enemies into the depths of the sea. They sank like stones beneath the mighty waters. You led our ancestors by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night so that they could find their way. You came down to Mount Sinai and you spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and instructions that were just and decrees and commands that were good. You instructed them concerning your holy Sabbath. You commanded them through Moses, your servant, to obey all your commands, decrees, and instructions. You gave them bread from heaven when they were hungry and water from the rock when they were thirsty. You commanded them to go and to take possession of the land that you had sworn to give them. But our ancestors were proud and stubborn. And they paid no attention to your commands. They refused to obey and did not remember the miracles that you had done for them. Instead, they became stubborn and appointed a leader to take them back into slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious, merciful, slow to become angry, rich in unfailing love. You did not abandon them, even when they made an idol shaped like a calf and said, this is our God who brought you out of Egypt. They committed terrible blasphemies, but in your great mercy, you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. The pillar of clouds still led them forward by day. and The pillar of fire showed them the way through night. You sent your good spirit to instruct them. And you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. For 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Then you helped our ancestors conquer kingdoms and nations and you placed your people on every corner of the land. They took over the land of King Shihan and Heshbon and the land of King Og of Bashan. You made their descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and you brought them into the land that you had promised to their ancestors, and they went in and they took possession of the land that you had subdued. Now, you see what was happening here? They're remembering God's faithfulness through the good, through the bad, and in particular through the ugly. Through the, through the nastiness of what had happened. 
through all of their, through all of their failures, that God had been with them and that he had never turned his back on them, even when they turned their backs on the law and when they turned their backs on God. God was still with them and his mercy was always available. Verse 28, but as soon as they were at peace, your people again committed evil in, their, in your sight. And once more you let their enemies conquer them. Yet whenever your people turned and cried to you again for help, you listened once more from heaven. In your wonderful mercy, you rescued them many times. You warned them to return to your law. But they became proud and obstinate and disobeyed your commands. They did not follow your regulations by which people will find life if only they obey. They stubbornly turned their backs on you and refused to listen. In your love, look at this, verse 30. I want you to, uh, for the next three, these next three verses, look at this. In your love, you are patient with them. For many years, you sent your spirit who warned them through the prophets but still they would not listen. So once again, you allowed the people to, of the land to conquer them. But in your great mercy, in your love, in your mercy, you did not destroy them completely. What a gracious and merciful God you are. He's remind, they're, they're saying, they're recognizing my God is loving, he is merciful, and he is gracious. He gives me love that I did not merit unconditionally. He gives me mercy. He does not let me get what I deserve. And then he's gracious. He gives me what I didn't deserve. And now our God, the great and mighty and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love, do not let all the hardships we have suffered seem insignificant to you. Great trouble has come upon us and upon our kings and leaders and priests, prophets and ancestors, all of your people from the days when the kings of Assyria first triumphed over us until now. They're taking ownership for what has happened. They are owning up to their part as well as the parts of what their ancestors did. That may be a lesson for some of us here today. Every time you punished us, you were being just. We had sinned greatly, and you gave us only what we deserved. Our kings, our leaders, and our ancestors did not obey your law or listen to the warnings in your commands and law. Even while they had their own kingdom, they did not serve you, though you showered your goodness on them. You made them a a large, fertile land but they refused to turn their wit from their wickedness. So now today we stand. We are slaves in the land of plenty that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. We're slaves here in this good land. Wow. Have you ever thought about that? Do you, do you understand what they're saying? They received everything that God had promised to them. They're standing in the land of plenty with nothing. God had given them the promise. Fulfillment of the promise was made, and yet they could not enjoy it. Why? Because their hearts weren't in the right place. I want to tell you, as we move forward, as we go into this next season, I, I, I truly believe this. I believe that God is allowing us to come into the land that was promised but I want to tell you this, I want, and, I, and I say this, I, I pray it's not, I'm not speaking prophetically, I pray that we're, it's just an admonition for us to, to keep our, that we would truly understand that even though we're walking into a facility and we're walking into the land of promise, that our eyes may be kept on the focus of what God has called us to do in that facility. It's not for our own entertainment. It's not for us not to have to set up and tear down. That's a, trust me, I love that. I want that. But it is not just for our ease and our comfort. 
It is literally for us to do what God has called us to do in that place. And that is to be a beacon of light. In, when we do that, when we do that, we will enjoy the land of our promise. But if we don't do that, we will be in a building. We won't have to set up and tear down. We won't have to worry about. We can have great fellowships there. But I'll tell you, it will be more of a burden than, than it will ever be a blessing. I've got, to, I've got to check my own heart in that. I don't want what we're walking into to be a burden rather than a blessing. And may we always keep our focus on that. Amen? Amen. So the people agreed. Listen to this. Listen to this. Verse, 30, verse 38, the people responded, in view of all of this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. On this sealed document are the names of our leaders, Levites, and priests. They're saying this. This is what they're declaring. We're holding everybody accountable. All of us will be held accountable. We're going to stand. We're going to declare this. We're going to believe it. We're going to move forward. We're going to rejoice in what God has given us. We're going to pray. We're going to fast. We're going to... Even even in the land of plenty, we're going to stay focused on what God has called us to do, what, where God has brought us to bring glory to the God who has brought us this to this place. I pray that we never lose sight of the fact that what God is doing is for the glory of God. It is not for the glory of Pastor Elliot. It is not for the glory of the children's church. It is not for the glory of the assemblies of God. It is not for the glory of those of you who have persevered to have your name somewhere on that building. And and we might have some some walls representing some things, you know, and, and maybe even having some pictures of the past. But it's not about any of that. It is about bringing glory to the one who is able to do abundantly, exceedingly beyond all that we could ever ask or imagine for His glory. It is Christ and Christ alone. In everything that we do, in every era of our life, in every success, in every failure, it is about bringing glory to God. May we move forward this year putting honor and glory to the one who has sent us. May it be about the lost. May our hearts grieve for the ones who have still yet to hear the message of Christ to a point where they are confronted with the decision. On this day, I will either choose to reject or accept. That is what it's all about. It's about us bringing the gospel and bringing a confrontation, a spiritual confrontation, where people have that opportunity. In the next moment, I'm going to ask you to do Gabrielle, I want to focus on Christ. I'm going to call us to do what these people did on this particular day. I'm going to call us as a leadership. Those of you who are leading ministries, those of you who are involved in being there when people come and you're a point of contact, whether it's a small group meeting, whether it's a ministry outside of the church, that when we recognize that it is all about God, that we recognize that what we're doing is not about ourselves, it's not about bringing glory to the to the body of Bridge of Life, to a name, the, the name of our church, the name of our denomination, the name of whatever it is. It's not about any of that. It's about bringing glory to God. And so we want to take just a moment this morning to humble our hearts.
I know as your pastor, I'm constantly reminded. I sat with the pastor at Evangel Temple the other day. And as we were leaving, he said this. I had, we had just talked about everything with the building. And he looked at me, he said, man, God is good. But I'll challenge you in this. He said, stay grounded. This is a great success, but stay grounded. He's not the only one. I, 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 man, there's other mentors in my life, others who are constantly speaking. I don't, trust me, I don't do this on my own. I could never do this on my own. I seek the wisdom of others who have gone before. As I looked at the life of Mike Baldry this last Thursday at his funeral, I was challenged over some things in my own life, things that I started out, man, the same passion, the same calling. I felt like those, he and I, man, we clicked when we went on into missions trips together. And as I listened to his family, as I listened to his friends, the admonition in my own heart to stay focused, to move where God tells me to move. That was his life's legacy. He did things different. He made relationships with government officials in other countries that no other person had the opportunity to make. But it wasn't because of anything that he did. It was because of the anointing in his life and his focus on doing what God told him to do. One of his family members made this comment. Said, you know, it took your death for everybody to recognize your life. May it not be about what we have, are doing, what title we have, what ministry we're serving in, may it be about the fact that we are being faithful and seeking His Spirit to move in us, to use us, to propel us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, He sat with His disciples. And He took and He broke the bread He would remind us that his body would be broken for us. If we can take this opportunity this morning and remember the sacrifice that by his stripes we have access to healing. I'm going to challenge you right now that as you take the bread and you break the bread to remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you for what you did on the cross. You take the bread. I thank you that you were a willing participant. It took your death for us to find life. In the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood that would be poured out for you. For without that shedding of the blood, there could could not be forgiveness of sins. It was a once and for all act. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ that His blood has redeemed us, has washed us, has cleansed us. And where our righteousness was like filthy rags, today we are more than conquerors through the blood of the Lamb. I thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood. Let's partake of the cup.